Tustin, Tustin. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it was all a bit rushed, so this one. So they probably didn't have time. Yeah. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I am coming through in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> okay, my bit's done. <laughs> I'll turn it off again.
Hello? Okay. That's fine. <clears throat> I think I should start shouting at people now. Yeah. It is quite blinding. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just waiting for people to speak. Yeah. 
their time or no you just let them just let them it's lunch, lunch it's lunch, lunch. just let them don't let them go over their own time so they're happy okay i think uh, if we can all take our seats so we can get started All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Helen Walden, and on behalf of Pietro Reversi, Ellie McCoy, and myself, uh, we'd very much like to thank you for uh, joining in in this year's CCP4 study weekend on molecular replacements. Um, so it's been six years since we last covered this topic, and we're very much looking forward to the program and hearing about the latest developments. We would also like to thank the uh, speakers for participating in the meeting, particularly those who've come from overseas. And we'd like to thank them all for accepting our invitation so quickly. It's really great to see that CCP4 um, can still uh, attract such a great array of speakers. Um, there's a couple of small announcements. First of all, um, could all of the speakers on the program please stay behind after this session just for a couple of minutes? Um, and secondly, when you want to ask questions after the talks, can you please wait until the microphone, um, until you've actually got the microphone in front of you so that the people who are listening online can also hear your question? So before I hand over to Ed, who is uh, going to chair this morning's introductory session, um, Keith Wilson would like to say a few words. Okay, so it, it, it's um, time for me to say a few rather sad words, I'm afraid, this morning. 2012 was um, a year when three of our sort of great and, my, in my case, long-term colleagues unfortunately passed away. Um, first of all, in, in September, Louise Johnson, after rather a long illness, and then, rather sadly, on Christmas Eve, both the same day, Guy Dodson and Roger Foom um, also died. So this was not a great end to 2012 for me. Um, now, I'd known Louise for many years since I was a PhD student. I started as Louise's second PhD student. So here was my sort of choice as supervisor. Um, so I clearly made the right choice, as you can see, from many points of view, but, <laughs> but, but mainly because Louise had chosen you know, a fantastic project to focus on for the next, I guess, 20 or more years of her life, namely the phosphorylase project. This was a huge, challenging crystallographic project for those days. It may sound nothing now, but the first ones we worked on were at 400,000 molecular weight in the asymmetric unit. We were trying to collect this on a um, single counter diffractometer. This was, to say the least, slow. And, you know, I almost may as well have used an electron microscope. Um, but, but things did work out, and Louise was just a great person to work with because she had the great insight to be working on one of those great challenges of the next year, namely control by phosphorylation of proteins. And I think this was really the first major phosphorylation system whose structure was, was, was eventually found. And Louise's importance obviously became clear. I, I'm trying to make this not too depressing a talk. It became clear in uh, quite early days there you can see a photograph from the front row of the zoology department, annual photograph in Oxford in, I think, 1977, just after Guy Eleanor had left, unfortunately. And as you can see, Louise's importance. There's Louise, and she's sitting. If you can see him on the second or the left here, the left hand of the Lord, Phillips, but even more importantly, on the left hand of God, or do I mean Dawkins, yeah? So, <laughs> you know, this is clearly a great recognition of Louise's important role in the future of science and crystallography in the UK. And she was just a fantastic supporter for myself and many other people, Martin included, over, over the next years. And Louise didn't push herself forward <coughs> to, to any great extent. You can see, for instance, here is Louise uh, pushing herself into the photograph from the back. Uh, there she is, you know, but her presence was felt at all these carbohydrate conferences. Here's Gideon also in, a, in an early phase of his career. 
But Louise concentrated so well on this problem in a sort of Max Perut, Dorothy Hodgkin style way, taking you know, a major topic and seeing it through from those very early stages to the massive fruition of the impact of phosphorylase on crystallography in, uh, over the years. And she then moved on, of course, to um, not only be the, the David Phillips Chair of Crystallography in Oxford, but also to become the Life Sciences Director out of Diamond. And she really was a great defender of sort of women in crystallography, again, following on Dorothy's fantastic tradition. And you can see Louise now out at Diamond, and you can see the impact of a woman in science, that you have a team of men, and the woman is the only one doing any work. You know? <laughs> you know, so this is you know, a fantastic breakthrough as they all sort of stand by and applaud in the background. But Louise did a great job throughout her career. She mentored so many people. And she also carried on this great tradition of, of many of, of Dorothy and others, as, as we'll hear from Gart with Guy, of spreading the word of crystallography to wider communities. For instance, she was a strong supporter of the Sesame Synchrotron in the Middle East and of research activities in, in, in Trieste and Pakistan and elsewhere. Um, then Guy. Guy I met almost the same time as Louise in about 1971. There he is. He passed away on um, Christmas Eve. The, the great structure he was involved in the early days was the insulin structure with he and Dorothy are always very strongly associated from the early days. And um, Guy was such a happy person. And you now here's something I picked off his school website. Now, if you want something interesting to read about the early years of Guy Dodson and his brother Morris, twin brother Morris, here they are in their school uniform from what was then, as very appropriate for Guy, a good Church of England boarding school with rigorous instruction. I did, this is what gave Guy his, his strong, focused religious personality. And as you can see on the school um, report there, the old boy profile, you should go and read this if you want an interesting stories about Guy's youth. They, he's a world-class old boy academic, it seems, <laughs> even recognized by Dillsworth School in, in New Zealand. But he stayed together with Morris, his, his much beloved twin brother, all his life really, because having been brought up in New Zealand, educated and, and graduated with his PhD from New Zealand, he then moved to Dorothy's group and was sold the insulin structure in Dorothy's group in the... Um, Late 60, in the mid-60s and early 70s, and then moved to York in the mid-70s, where he established what eventually became the York Structural Biology Laboratory. He built it up from just Guy and Eleanor, or in Eleanor built it up from just Guy and Eleanor, to be you know, a grouping of around 60 people and, and play sort of quite a big role on the world stage of protein crystallography. So here's a typical happy photograph of Guy, so sort of fantastic pleased with Dorothy to have sold the insulin structure in the day when we used to build re real physical models, and also then attending a meeting in China, I think in 1977, where you can see Guy and Eleanor sitting around the table with the, the Chinese um, colleagues. Another great aspect of Guy's work was, was just his fantastic outreach all over the world, encouraging people to come and visit the lab. Uh, huge numbers of people passed through York, many of them through the Dodson household. And, and just, you know, visiting so many places with, and, and seeing emerging crystallography groups grow up with his encouragement. So it, it's impossible to pick a set of photographs which really encompass Guy's life. Here's a handful of them. Here's Guy and Eleanor. Eleanor, of course, being a seminal part of this contribution. Uh, there's Guy posing with an object who I, which I don't recognize. Guy in a typical organized pose with his pullover. Um, part of a musical group down in Cuba in his totally organized office. In, in York, he was always a great person for admin. Uh, one of my colleagues in York remembers turning up to do a peer observation of one of Guy's lectures, which would have been fine. So this became a sort of difficult peer uh, review exercise. And um, finally, on the right again, on, on tour with one of his sort of older, more stony friends. So Guy was just, you know, a fantastic person. Whenever you met him, you talk to Guy for five minutes, most of the problems of the world seem to go away. And he always felt such a better sort of view of life. After even a few minutes spent in his presence, and I had the privilege to spend a, a lot of time in Guy's presence. Uh, and there he is in true sort of communicative style, explaining how important science was, and particular protein crystallography, to the world at large. And it's people like Guy who really sort of, you know, carried on the import of, the, of our field for so many years. Roger Foom, I first met when I had to try to collect 
data on phosphorylation from Louise's lab in the late 70s. And Roger was, again, a sort of hero. He, he pioneered the establishment of synchrotron beam lines for protein crystallography at Lua. And you can see the impact it had on our research in Oxford. There on the right here is one of our early photographs, uh, rotation photographs of phosphorylase B. This took about 13 hours in the Oxford lab, by which time the crystal was dead. And on the left, you can see how in four minutes we could do the same thing in Lua. And this just transformed our way of data collection. And Roger really pioneered this area in setting up effective beam lines. All this with the, you know, the great safety measure. In those days, the hutch really was a hutch. It looked like a big rabbit hutch. It was made of plywood with um, lead embedded within it, in it, within its walls. And in order to line up the beam, one used to lock Roger inside, and he would then twiddle the knobs on the rotation camera, get the optimum beam through before being released from the so-called hutch. It really, it really was a hutch. And like with Guy, his sort of, sort of impish nature and sort of slightly rebellious streak, he was all as a great member of the, the left and held his politics very strongly all his life through all the trials and tribulations. I remember turning up Lua when they just instigated a new pass system of the, the keypad entry on the door to secure this site from, from trespassers. Um, this was slightly undermined by the fact there was an envelope on the door saying, here, Keith, the numbers for the door are just inside the envelope. So <laughs> they, that, that, that made it very easy in spite of all the security to get in. And Roger's impact was great. I mean, he, he pioneered the work at Lua in the early days on this very sort of um, basic synchrotron line. But it was really Roger who also was one of the great supporters for making sure that the Soleil synchrotron was actually built in, in Paris at a time of, of really sort of rather strong economic recession as, as we have now and the attempts of, the, of both the UK and the French governments not to build us other synchrotrons. I remember turning up at meetings with Roger to help defend this operation. So, you know, I always used to turn up at CCP4 meeting and say, what's important in crystallography, is this is the old Blairite view, you know, education, education. Uh, he, he did say that, he didn't mean it. I, I do mean this. Data is important, but what's even more important in crystallography is just people. And, you know, this set of people, I, I mean, Eleanor's still with us, fortunately, so I, but I put her on the slide with Guy. Louise, Guy, Roger made such a big contribution to our field. They've really, you know, were some of the, the founding fathers. It'll be hard to sort of to, to follow on from. So with all of them, I just felt, you know, whenever I talked to them, I just felt great about science. They were all positive about the future, especially with Roger and, and Guy. They were so positive about the, the correct political way ahead. And one always felt just a fun, sort of transforming influence about these guys who would really stimulate young students, postdocs, everybody around them. Such, and Guy and Eleanor's case, such great hosts, this whole mass of people. Um, many of you here must have had contacts with Guy and Eleanor directly over the years. So I'd like to just have one minute silence where I won't say anything. And so now we go back to the future. We go back to the main focus of the meeting. MR, many results. Um, I was going to put the other sort of contrasting acronym of, of NMR, which you might be able to work out the commentary, but, but actually NMR is now very important. So I can't quite say this with such confidence anymore that, that I sort of backed off from that. But we are back into the main theme of the meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to say these few words 
uh, about my sort of heroes who sadly passed away. And so with CCP4, I would like just to make a couple more comments now, again, for the future. The present team, led by Eugene, have made dramatic improvements in the suite in recent times to get the automatic update system implemented. This is now in the current download of the suite, and I can only encourage everybody to get all members of their labs to make sure they install the latest version of CCP4 and install the download system so they do get all the updates at regular intervals and see these continually appear on their, magically on their screen. For the working group one people, I'd like to make sure that you all know that to be active participants in CCP4, you should really be on the working group one list. Anybody from UK industry or from any academic lab who can, who is a PI and can hold a research grant is eligible to join CCP4 Working Group 1 and have a vote and a say in, its fu in the future of the organization. And in particular, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be circulating information about the election of a new chair to try to replace Martin, um, who sadly is not going to continue, I, I think, unless we can really twist his arm yet again, but that's not going to work. So we are going to have to activate a real selection process over the course of the next month to which I hope many of you will contribute. Please also make sure if you've got young colleagues who should join Working Group 1 who aren't on that list at the moment or you aren't getting the messages, please do make contact to join the list. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Is this on? Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Keith, for those moving words. Um, and thank you for making it almost impossible to follow you. Good luck with that, Martin. Welcome to CCP4 Study Weekend on Molecular Replacements. This is your first session. Two introductory talks on molecular replacement. First of all, Martin Noble from Newcastle University with an introduction to molecular replacements. Thanks very much. <coughs> and uh, thanks very much to the organizers for giving me a chance to, uh, to, to give this introduction to molecular replacement. It's been a, a Christmas season I'm sure you've all enjoyed to a great extent. Uh, this is where the work starts. Um, what I'll do is try and scoot over it, introducing some of the concepts which will be returned to in much greater detail over uh, the, 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 the next couple of days. I'm going to go way further back than you may think necessary, but that's because I remember just the grim awfulness of sitting somewhere uh, slightly hungover occasionally uh, in the back, um, really not knowing what the arrows meant. And, and um, I didn't not enjoy the meeting, don't get me wrong, but um, I didn't take as much from it. So I'm going to go way back. Uh, so this should be very gentle, but um, you, you'll, you'll see more about this stuff uh, uh, as we go on. I have stolen mercilessly from Phil Evans who gave a, uh, the similar talk in 2007. <coughs> I've stolen a little bit from Early. Uh, all the bits that are right, you may sensibly attribute to Phil and Early. Uh, any mistakes or inaccuracies, uh, you can uh, sensibly uh, consider to be my fault. So you remember the phase problem, don't you? Uh, just before you went away for your mince pies, you had collected some data, <coughs> and for some reason, someone was telling you that you were not able to look at a picture of your molecule yet. Uh, and it's because the data that you collected was not such data as you would record with an optical or an electron microscope. So rather than having an object which is uh, scattering uh, rays, uh, having a lens that gathers them back together and uh, uh, returning an image of the object that was scattering, uh, you had a slightly compromised crystallographic experiment where you were exposing some x-rays onto uh, a sample. Uh, they were scattered, and what you were collecting uh, was the scattered image rather than uh, a, a direct image of the uh, object under study. Um, that means that it's hard to recover an image because uh, at this plane uh, you can record the intensities of these scattered waves but it's very hard to record the phases about which we'll say a little bit more. How can you get access to the phases? 
Well, the context for direct replacement is it's one of three main techniques that can be used to get the initial phase estimates. The first one is to do an experiment, and doing experiments is not a bad idea. Um, in fact, I think almost everyone who does molecular replacement would say that uh, th there's no harm in, in you know, trying to collect some sad s from sulfur or selenium metal, or whatever, uh, as, as, as well. Um, so doing an experiment, that's always a good one, uh, but that's not the topic of this meeting, sad, mad, MIR, that kind of thing. Um, there are mathematical approaches which yield uh, phase estimates, and they're based on some fortunate um, relationships that uh, arise between reflections if you make some assumptions which are reasonably obeyed by the crystals we have, uh, specifically that the um, electron density is positive, uh, atoms are randomly distributed, uh, equally separated. Uh, and based on those assumptions, as long as you have high-resolution data, you can get phases. But that, unfortunately, is the restriction that we generally don't have. We don't have sufficient... Um, uh, uh, reflections of sufficient quality to allow us to exploit that particular approach. So what I'm going to be talking about, what this meeting is about, is uh, uh, molecular replacement, or as I introduced in the abstract, uh, this is a phase transplant. I thought at this point that I might show you some pictures of phase transplants, but really... Um, so this is actually something else being transplanted. I, I don't know what... Okay, so the notations and, and things that you'll see as people uh, describe methods and theories and stuff, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go way back to um, uh, deriving uh, uh, an equation that you're all very familiar with in order to uh, uh, find a way into showing you the representations we use and the sort of maths that's going on here. What we're trying to do is pretend that there was a lens. We're trying to pretend that there was a lens that had... Uh, bent all these beams back together, and that at a certain point, on a uh, on a on maybe on a piece of uh, 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 photographic film or something, an image was being regenerated. In terms of physics, what's going on there? Well, these these waves are coming in, the green wave and the blue wave, for example, uh, and they are uh, arriving at this point in space on the on the on the uh, on the piece of film, uh, and they are interfering with each other in depositing energy. And how much energy they deposit, the intensity of the um, uh, picture a re uh, of, of the direct image, depends on how these guys interfere. If they interfere constructively, then there'll be a, a big wave resultant and, and you'll get deposition of a significant amount of energy, you'll get a dark bit of the uh, film. Uh, otherwise, if they uh, interfere destructively, then they won't work. So doing that mathematically, what we're trying to do is just work out how waves add up. Remember, we've recorded something about these waves. We recorded their amplitudes when we collected our diffraction pattern. So what we're trying to do is work out how they, wave up, uh, how they add up. How do waves add up? Well, you can draw two waves like this and remind you of the two properties that are uh, important for this purpose. Uh, one is that they have an amplitude. Say this blue wave might have been a relatively small wave, a, a relatively small uh, diffracted wave. And the green wave is a relatively large one. They also have a property which is phase, and that's the relative dif distance between the maxima of the green one and the maxima of the blue one. That's the property which we haven't recorded and which, makes, uh, wh which is what we're trying to solve. Um, there's another representation that you'll come across a lot in, in, in discussions about phasing, which is this representation of those waves. I said they've got an amplitude and a phase. Um, that's a property which vectors drawn out from the origin of the complex plane also have. They have a, an amplitude, which can be uh, uh, noted in their length, and they have a phase, which is the angle that they make with the um, um, positive real axis. Uh, there's also a mathematical notation, which derives from the fact that uh, e to the i times some number um, behaves very much like uh, 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 things uh, oscillating around um, th this I in the complex plane. So as you increase this number alpha, uh, this, uh, this term here, um, uh, first of all, uh, changes to be uh, large and complex, uh, then large and negative and real, uh, and so on, as, as you in increase this um, uh, coefficient alpha here. So that's a mathematical formula which behaves like these vectors, and those vectors have got similar properties to the waves. So that's what uh, all this annotation is about. How, do, how do they, then do they add up? Well, in these wave things, you can draw them and you can just sum the values, and, and that's, that's not a very easy way to predict how they add up. 
Happily, if you just draw the corresponding vectors nose to tail, you find out how they add up. And that's what this green one and this blue one is doing, adding up to make the orange one there. Uh, and mathematically, you just do a, a, a summation. And therefore, this equation, which you probably didn't know you derived before lunch, uh, the electron density equation is really a very simple statement of, 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 of waves adding up. Uh, the electron density that would be evaluated th at this point here is the sum over all of the beams that come in, all of these reflections that have gone out from your crystal, uh, of this complex number with an amplitude and a phase, which is the scattered beam, uh, and then an additional phase perturbation term that depends on where in space you're looking and um, uh, the direction in which that beam is coming in. All that sort of makes great sense and is the electron density equation. Similarly, uh, you can think about scattering and, and you get a very similar thing. The scattered wave is a, a, a sum of uh, contributing scattered waves. Why this is relevant to molecular replacement is that the mathematical form that's involved there is the Fourier transform. And uh, this is a clear statement of the fact that the electron density is the Fourier transform of the diffraction pattern. Uh, so if you know the amplitudes and phases, you can conduct a Fourier transform and do uh, uh, recover the electron density. That's what you're trying to do in trying to form an image. Um, but similarly, if you've got an electron density distribution, you can conduct a Fourier transform and you can come up with some amplitudes and phases. And that's what you're going to do uh, in molecular replacement. So molecular replacement with identical crystals is completely trivial. If they're truly identical crystals, you may wonder what is the value of the experiment. Um, but uh, to a first approximation, if they're near enough identical, then uh, uh, this is completely trivial. You've recorded your set of uh, uh, reflections. They've got Miller indices. They've got an estimate of the amplitude. They've got an estimate of the, f uh, and they've got no estimate of the phase. You have a known structure which you've solved and, and from which you can calculate, because of what I just said, you can calculate phases. You just copy those phases from this column into that column and use those terms in the electron density equation and uh, there's your image of your molecule. Uh, voila. <coughs> so I said identical crystals. Uh, they don't, of course, you wouldn't do the experiment if they were completely identical cri crystals. Um, there will be small differences, and those differences will particularly show up during the course of refinement. Your model will evolve to uh, reflect the differences in the constitution of your crystal, um, and at the end of the refinement, the phases will have changed away from those that you've taken from the known structure. Um, uh, but so, so you've got a starting point for refinement rather than a final phase set. Um, molecular replacement with identical crystals is so uh, simple, it's often not called molecular replacement. It's just called uh, difference Fourier method. Uh, and it is used for solving useful things like point mutants of proteins or where a protein is bound to a ligand. You know, just a little tiny change uh, hasn't changed the um, packing of the molecules, hasn't changed the unit cells, uh, hasn't significantly changed the conformation of the uh, uh, protein or uh, domain movements or anything like that. So how about if you've got non-identical crystals? Say this was crystallized in one particular crystal form. The data that you've collected is in a different crystal form. You can no longer simply cut and paste these phases over here. Uh, there's all, all sorts of ways of understanding why that is, but it is it's just the case that the phases that, that, uh, that calculate directly, trivially, from the, the known structure uh, cannot be applied over here. Uh, you're sampling the molecular transform in a different way. So the challenge then is to determine how you would have to take this molecule, what um, uh, spatial transformation you'd have to apply to this molecule to, f to superimpose it on the place where the um, uh, molecule is in the crystal for which you've just collected data, the unknown structure. And once you've done that, once you've applied that transformation, you can then calculate the phases uh, and then paste them in there. But you have to have that transformation first. And that process is the one which is most frequently called molecular replacement. The molecular replacement process is identifying the, 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 the transformation and using it to, to um, uh, provide phases. There are other uses of the term molecular replacement. The first um, uh, use of it was, was slightly different. Uh, people who are interested, uh, go, go and have a look at Rossman and Blow papers, this sort of thing. Okay, so you will need a model for this. It has to be a good model. We assume that proteins with similar sequences um, have similar tertiary folds, and therefore they are suitable for use in this process. You need the structure from which you calculate the phases to be close to the structure uh, uh, for which you collected data. Um, that means that there can't have been uh, a large conformational change, um, or at least there has to be a substantial core of it which uh, uh, is unchanged. 
and in the um, uh, uh, paper which I'll prepare for this, I'll, I'll do some examples uh, uh, from the database just to show how far out you can go uh, in order to uh, still allow a structure to be determined by molecular replacement doing some systematic stuff. Um, the model should ideally have a high completeness, um, but this is perhaps less important than its core being really um, very similar to the, um, the, the, the structure which you've crystallized anew. I took also the slide transitions from Phil. I would never do anything like that. So m making a model, you start off with this homologous structure uh, which has been solved elsewhere. There's a few things that you might choose to do with it. Uh, one thing is you might take a look at all in, in a database to discover all of the uh, related structures which are out there, and you might wish to produce a composite model from those. Um, you certainly might wish to produce one of these alignments anyway to understand what are the typically conserved and the typically varying parts of a structure um, because, uh, as I say, an accurate core might be the, the thing that you wish to include in your structure factor calculations and in your molecular replacement model. So um, looking at sequences, doing alignments, that's an important first uh, step of it all. You can then do subsequent manipulation of the model, and there's some very exotic ones. Uh, for example, MR Rosetta applies some very sophisticated modeling tools to allow you to make your model, um, without reference to the uh, uh, diffraction data, make your model look more like the structure you're trying to solve. And that's only very recently been possible. In the past, you've been able to put them through energy minimization and mutation, and you get a structure that was different, but not closer to reality. Uh, recent tools, that's, not, that, that's, that's ceasing to be the case, and you'll hear um, about some, some other developments which, um, uh, uh, which are addressing that problem. There are some simple-minded uh, changes you may make. For example, you might uh, look at, for example, here's a, um, a, a leucine in our search model. Um, say that was an aspartate in the unknown structure. The, the sort of things you might wish to do is um, keep all of the leucine because the leucine has got similar atoms to an aspartate. If you just replace those with uh, oxygens, then the, the shape of it is not completely different. So if you can find some sort of structural equivalence, then you might say that this would be a good residue to keep. Uh, other approaches trim them down to those which are truly common atoms, not just in, in count and, and topology, but also in uh, character, for example, um, uh, trimming back to C gamma in this case. Uh, other approaches trim uh, unlike amino acids back down to C beta. All of these things, I think it's still up in the air as to what the best practice is, and if you do not get a trivial solution, then that's the sort of thing you may, may wish to do. I said that conformational changes can confound the molecular replacement process. Um, can you anticipate those changes? Well, there are tools which allow you to do that, either from analyzing trajectories in, in simulation programs. Those also aren't as bad as they used to be. Or from looking at an ensemble of structures that are related. From such an ensemble, you can infer uh, the type of domain motions that, that a, a thing may, may involve. And this is, this is um, you know, one of the tools which is out there, Concord that allows you to do that, and that's for a protein kinase. And you can see that they do you know, predict sensible molecular motions. And then you might generate models which are, um, uh, represent intermediate points along these, these, these preferred motions that a molecule may make. Uh, and uh, there are tools, um, I think phase has got some built in for, for, for doing that even. Um, or you might use a, an, an ensemble. So some programs, uh, Phaser is the one that springs to my mind, um, allow you to input a, uh, not one uh, search model, but rather a superimposed family of search models, uh, each one of which may have some part of it which is more accurate than the others. Um, it allows you to specify an appropriate weighting uh, based on uh, anticipated RMSD or on sequence identity um, to, to, to consider how, how much weight it should be given in them. But again, this is something which can make a difference between success and failure in uh, molecular replacement. So there's your model. How are you going to position it appropriately in the unit cell? Um, well, each molecule that you have to place, and that may mean two molecules in the case of a complex, or may, 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 maybe many, many more, um, each one has six parameters associated with it. Three to define its orientation, and three uh, to define its uh, translation, its position in the unit cell. Uh, if you have n molecules, then rather than six parameters, there's six n parameters, and that is a lot. So that means that you can't just calculate structure factors for every hypothesis, because that would take too long. How long would it take? Well, if you search three rotational angles on a grid like this, 0 to 360, 0 to 180, 0 to 360, in 2.5 degree intervals, 
uh, then that's, that's a million. Three translations on a one angstrom grid on a typical unit cell size um, or Cheshire cell size is a f uh, further 10 to 60. A 60 search for that is 10 to the 12 points. 10 to the 12 structure factor evaluations is not going to happen. Um, so you would have to come up with a more efficient search strategy for that. Uh, by contrast, if you break down, factor out the rotation and the translation searches, the 3D search for, for uh, rotation uh, would be you know, something like this, 1.5 times 10 to the 6. I don't know why that's become 2.5. Um, sorry. <laughs> ah, is that how I've done it? <laughs> Th that is exactly how I've done it, yes. <laughs> but I don't know how you, anyway, 2.5 times 10 to the 6. So he's done, so he's assumed, so Phil assumed that your first rotation function solution was correct and hasn't done n, y it, it may be, uh, um, N, N lots of the translational search. But much more manageable, that's the point, a million fold uh, more manageable. Um, so we factor the search into uh, rotation and translation searches. Um, how do we find the uh, rotation? Well, there's, um, what you do is for each potential orientation, for each potential orientation, uh, we evaluate the consistency of that model with the observed data. We can do that using Patterson's uh, or maximum likelihood, about which I will say a very, each of which I will say a very few words uh, shortly. You can think of those parameters as spanning a space, like X, Y, and Z span a Cartesian space, alpha, beta, gamma can span a, a, a different space, and you can make a map of that. You find peaks in that map, and those maps, are th those peaks correspond to candidate uh, uh, rotations that may be applied to your molecule. Um, each of those you may carry forward into a translation search. And for the translation search, uh, you can take the oriented molecules and you can translate them around in the unit cell on a, uh, again on a, a, a grid search, looking for the consistency either of um, calculated Patterson's, uh, maybe correlation of uh, structure factor amplitudes, uh, or using a, a likelihood term. Again, I'll say a very little bit about each of those. Again, this, this kind of spans a space, a three-dimensional search space. You find peaks in that. And when you've done that, you've identified the uh, rotation and translation appropriately. Just a little bit about rotations, because I can't not include it. Um, the general mathematical form for a rotation about one of the Cartesian axes uh, is, is given by this relatively simple matrix up here. This is a rotation around Z. Fact is that by rotating around one of the Cartesian axes, X, Y, or Z, you can't access all different rotations. So I can't take this and superimpose it on uh, that just by rotating around X, Y, or Z wouldn't work. So that's why we say there are um, more than one parameters in a rotation uh, function search. In fact, uh, there are always three. Um, the way in which you break those down, there are two main uh, categories. One is uh, uh, Euler, Euler angles, uh, and the other is spherical polar angles. Uh, I'm going to call them Euler angles. And I, I, anyway. Uh, go like this. You apply three serial rotations. The first one around typically around the z-axis, uh, and uh, uh, if it's the first one you apply, then you call it uh, theta 3 for reasons I'm not uh, going to go into immediately. Um, if you then rotate around one of the other axes, either the x or the y-axis, in this case around the x-axis, uh, by a, 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 an angle theta 2, uh, and then finally rotate around the new z-axis uh, by a, a, an angle uh, theta 1. So that's, you, you apply... Uh, First, a rotation around one axis, and then you take the whole thing, rotate it around a, a second axis, and then rotate it around a third axis. And that allows you to access all possible rotations. An alternative way of uh, phrasing this is to choose an arbitrary axis, that's this uh, axis here, uh, relative to the Cartesian frame. Typically, that's defined in terms of two other angles. Um, it's uh, something like psi down from the uh, pole, from the z-axis, and an angle... Uh, uh, phi around from x. So uh, these two angles, the uh, phi and psi, define the direction in which this axis points. And then the third rotation angle is uh, uh, an angle uh, which may be called chi, which uh, is a rotation around that axis. Again, by th these allow you to point the, the these two allow you to point the axis in any direction. 
if you then subsequently allow yourself to rotate by any value around that axis, again, you can access all possible rotations. So these are two distinct ways of dividing up the, the, the space of, um, uh, of rotations. Um, the mathematical notation is, is uh, not tremendously important. That's, that's three um, rotations around Cartesian axes, rather like this one, uh, all chained together, and you, you end up with something which is ugly but, but manageable for computers. Uh, and then, uh, si similarly, this is, um, this is the rotation matrix that you derive from this. So what volume of uh, possible orientation space do you have to search? How many different orientations do you have to try? Well, that depends a bit on the symmetry of the crystal. Um, for example, if you've got a two-fold rotation axis in your uh, crystal symmetry, you, you realize that you don't have to take this and try all different orientations because um, half of the orientations would be sufficient to identify that one or that one. If you try all different orientations, you'll identify this molecule and that molecule, and, and, and that's a sort of redundancy. Working out which angles are unique and which angles are, are required is um, uh, uh, it, it's a nicety, really, and, and all the programs that you will encounter will, will do it very adequately for you. So um, <coughs> I've said you're going to try all these sets of angles. What are you going to do to, s to identify the correct solution? What's going to be the, the, the penalty or the score that you apply uh, or that you identify for each score. Well, if you were doing a, a full 6D search and uh, you were orienting and translating your molecule, then you could take that oriented, translated molecule, calculate structure factor amplitudes, and evaluate their consistency with the observed structure factor amplitudes. Life would be very easy. But there is a problem with the first search, if it's the rotation search, and it's this. Um, because uh, the... the um, <coughs> because you do not apply the appropriate translation, because you get a, a, your correctly oriented molecule will not necessarily be in the right place in the unit cell, you cannot calculate structure factor amplitudes from it. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit why that is uh, in a bit. And so you, need, you can't evaluate the consistency of structure factor amplitudes calculated and observed to score the rotation function. You need something else, uh, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what those are. One such is the Patterson function. Now, the Patterson function, uh, the mathematical formula up here, looks rather like the electron density equation, except with squared structure factor amplitudes uh, and, and phases um, set to zero. So it's, um, uh, it, it's rather like the, the, the Fourier transform, but, uh, but, uh, but, but without requiring knowledge of the phase. If you calculate that from your set of um, observed structure factors, what do you get? Well, you get this. Say that was the molecule that you'd crystallized. Calculating a map like this wouldn't return you a picture of that molecule, but it would return you a picture that's related, and it's related in this way. It's related because the, um, uh, the, the Patterson function is a, a map of the interatomic vectors. So because there's an interatomic vector from A to B, there'll be a peak here in the Patterson map, separated by that displacement vector away from the origin, and so on. It's related to the structure, but different to the structure. And importantly, <coughs> it depends on the orientation of the structure. You can calculate it without knowing phases, and yet it depends on the orientation of the structure. Indeed, as you spin the molecule, you spin the structure. Uh, you spin the Patterson as well. So this is something you can calculate and evaluate from both your observed uh, structure and from your model in all different orientations, and you can calculate the, the consistency of those, those Patterson uh, structures, Patterson maps. Just very little bit about Patterson's um, early discouraged me from including anything, but um, I, I, I still think this is relevant. Um, <coughs> say you had an isolated molecule like an E, its pattern function would look like that. So this is just showing you how patterns get more complex as you introduce more elements. And yet there are some things which are kind of vaguely recognizable, like this, this uh, uh, frequent uh, 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 interatomic vectors along here and along here that correspond to those dots and those dots and, and these off-diagonal off terms. The, it's got echoes of the structure in it. The reason that it's not trivial to solve structures with Pattersons is this that um, let, let's put um, not just an isolated molecule, but rather a, a different letter, um, a P and a D in, in, or rather a P in space group P2. 
and the pattern is hugely more complicated. And not all of the peaks in this um, more complicated pattern tell you about the orientation at all. In fact, it's divided into two parts, two elements, uh, a set of interatomic vectors, intramolecular, so with, within, um, uh, within one P, but interatomic vectors within one P, and a set of intermolecular vectors. Now, these are um, vectors from between, say, that atom and that atom over here. So this picture here, this pattern that you get, is, is uh, in fact dominated by terms which aren't sensitive to the rotation or aren't trivially sensitive to the rotation. Which is why um, uh, uh, Randy, Early, and others have developed um, programs like Phaser, which take advantage of maximum likelihood. Uh, I don't know th uh, how much introduction you're going to get to maximum likelihood elsewhere. Um, here's just some words of wisdom. Um, uh, Randy's paper in, in 2001, an ActiCrisp paper, um, uh, summarized very, very, very nicely. That the principle of maximum likelihood is indeed quite simple. Best model is most consistent with the observations. Consistency is measured statistically by the probability that the observations should have been made, i.e. that your model would give rise to the observations that you have. And this formulation allows you to take into account all the things that you know, all your expectations, of the things that you don't know, uh, all your understanding of errors. Uh, and I'll just say a, a very little bit about a, 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 a how it can be used in, in, in rotation function, how that relates to rotation function. Consider something that's crystallized in this P6 space group. There are six copies, um, six asymmetric units in the unit cell in, 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 in P6. And so for every molecule, um, for example, this red one here, in P6, there are five other molecules, each one related by a 60-degree rotation uh, around, um, uh, around the axis. Now, um, for each of those molecules, say, say we take our search molecule and uh, we put it in that orientation. From that search molecule, from that isolated search molecule, we can calculate, using the stuff I showed you before, the uh, uh, summation of, 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 uh, uh, of scattering factors, we can calculate the contribution that this red molecule will make to a particular um, uh, reflection. And we can do the same. If, if there's one in, in this orientation, we know that there'll be an orange one re re related by 60-degree rotation around the axis, a green one rotated by 120, and so on, and so on, and so on. For each of those, we can calculate the magnitude of the contribution that they would make to the um, scattering by the whole unit cell. What we cannot do is work out the, 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 the intensity of the reflection that would therefore result, or rather the structure factor amplitude of the reflection that would result. We can't do that because we don't know, um, while we're just evaluating ro rotations, we don't know how the phase of the contribution from this molecule uh, would relate to the phase of this one, and therefore whether they would uh, interfere constructively or destructively. We can calculate their individual contributions in terms of uh, amplitude. We can't sum those individual contributions because we don't know the phase. So in maximum likelihood, when you don't know something, you allow it to take all values. Uh, and that's what uh, I'm trying to indicate here. Say the red one gave rise to the biggest single contribution. Let's call that F big. What do you do for the other contributions? How can you, um, you, can't, you can't draw the nose to tail scattering vectors as, as uh, I, I showed you in the electron density and structure factor amplitude um, uh, equations. But you know the F big will be in there. So let's, let's say the biggest uh, contribution is like that. The next contribution will be from this um, uh, magenta molecule here. But we don't know what the relative phase will be. Hi, five, I'll scoot. Uh, we don't know what its relative phase will be. And so we have to consider that it might be up here, it might be uh, anywhere around there. Uh, similarly, the green one, maybe the next largest one, uh, that, that, that will add up on the end of any of these positions, uh, and so on. In, in, in effect, the other uh, 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 copies contribute in a statistical way to the, structure, to the expected structure factor amplitude. And we can take into account how that's going to work by modeling it as a, a, a random walk. We don't know what direction it's going to be, but we know what length it's going to be. Uh, and we can come up with a distribution um, uh, here 
for the uh, expected structure factor amplitude. And that's the best job that we can do. And that can be used to evaluate whether the rotation is more or less consistent with the observed structure factor amplitudes. You'll hear other stuff like this again, and it'll make more sense. So Patterson's um, have, uh, what you do is you um, uh, 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 do a trick to try and identify something you can calculate that um, uh, allows you to assess rotations. Um, uh, maximum likelihood, you take into account um, the, that which is known and, 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 and that which is unknown, uh, and you come up with a very sensitive way of scoring uh, candidate rotations. In all these cases, what sort of things do you, um, what, what, what control do you have over the process? Well, as I said, the model, which is tremendously important, uh, is something that you will have come up with. The resolution of the data that you use, you maybe won't use it all to the, the fullest resolution that you collected. Um, uh, and then for the, for the different um, uh, methods, there are, there are subtle things that you can uh, 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 perturb as well. Um, so, Rotation functions, uh, as, as I've described them to you, uh, doing all those calculations is, is r remains uh, rather in, in intensive. For the Patterson approach, uh, a tremendous contribution was made by Crowther and Blow, who recognized that you could recast it by expanding your Patterson in terms of spherical harmonics rather than in, in Cartesian space. Uh, and uh, if you do that, then you can evaluate um, uh, the consistency of Patterson's using uh, a fast Fourier transform. So that's an important, uh, that was a, a major contribution, so it just fits in there. Um, similar, you can't do a similar speed up for an analytical maximum likelihood um, uh, 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 approach, but you can do it for uh, an approximation to that, and you can use that to do a, a first pass filter, and then a second pass high accuracy rescoring using the um, maximum likelihood target function uh, and uh, assess the significance by scoring also random rotations. So the translation is then much easier because as soon as you're taking an oriented molecule and translating it around the unit cell, you can evaluate how good it is by calculating structure factors from it. Uh, and so you may score it by an R factor or correlation. You may choose Patterson's because they, they, they also can be calculated rather quickly. Uh, or you may choose maximum likelihood, which allows you to input the most uh, prior information that you have about uh, e expectations of um, uh, errors in your data and in your model. Just to illustrate something about um, how Patterson's work for, for translation functions, if you've got a, a P1 unit cell, there's no symmetry present then actually, there, and, and you've only got one molecule to place, then there is no translation function to be done. Remember, the translation function was about finding where a molecule is with respect to a, a, a symmetry element. Because it, uh, it's about looking at how the, the, um, the, the, the scattering contribution from one asymmetric unit adds up with the scattering contribution from another asymmetric unit. In P1, there's only one asymmetric unit. There's no translation function to be done. Um, it's only when you have symmetry elements that there is a, a translation question that's quite well illustrated in the case of Patterson's. For example, here, are, here, here is a molecule in one position with respect to a twofold uh, rotation axis, and here are some of the uh, intermolecular vectors uh, uh, that arise from this oriented molecule at this place in the unit cell. I take the molecule in the same orientation, but I put it at a different position in the unit cell. See, instead of being down here, I've slid it up along here. Uh, and now look at the uh, inter-atomic um, uh, vectors, you can see they're different. And so that's why the translation is, 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 is significant only in the context of uh, symmetry elements, and why the Patterson is a, uh, an approach that can be used to solve it. You can make it more sensitive by subtracting the intramolecular uh, vectors, but I'm not going to, oh Lord, uh, <laughs> take a approach about that. Again, the uh, best formulation is a, a maximum likelihood one. And here, you, you can do slightly better than the random walk of structure factor contributions that I showed you before. Um, because you're trying, your model is a translation. And so as soon as you've translated the molecules, you know their amplitude and phase. But maximum likelihood in this context allows you to take into account the expected error in your structure uh, and, and therefore come up with the best um, value FC to, to use in, 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 in determining 
um, the um, probability of FO that would derive from a particular model. Okay, some niceties. <coughs> the translation search, just like I said, crystallographic symmetry affects how many rotations you have to try. You don't have to try all orientations if you've got a high symmetry space group. Similarly, it affects the, the, the different sets of translations that you may have to apply. Um, one uh, uh, consideration here is, 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 is potential origins. So, for example, in P2, here is a unit cell, and you can see it's characterized by twofold axes here, 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 and here. Now, those are all kind of uh, crystallographically equivalent, and any of them could serve uh, e equally as a, uh, an, an origin of the unit cell. And as such, let's just uh, draw on one, two, three, four. Those are four um, uh, unit cells, all of which have uh, um, uh, different origins, um, but all of which are equally valid as choices. Um, now, you, there's no reason to take your uh, oriented molecule and search throughout this whole volume. In fact, if you search within the uh, restricted cell, the Cheshire cell, then that is sufficient to uh, identify the correct position um, of, of the molecule. That is no longer true as soon as you position one of the molecules because then the, the rest of the unit cell is no, the, the, the choice of origin is defined. And the other molecule has to be positioned correctly relative to the defined origin that you've chosen, uh, and therefore you have to search over the whole uh, of the unit cell. The same is true uh, in P1, where I said in P1 there's no translation function. Well, there is if you've already positioned one molecule. If you know the position of and, and orientation of one molecule, the next molecule has to be added in a position that's consistent with that. It's defined the origin. Again, it's about having the relative phase of this uh, uh, contribution add up appropriately with the, um, uh, the contribution from, from, from the first unit cell. Phaser is um, uh, the, 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 the CCP4 is probably... Um, uh, most widely used package, although there are a, a number of choices, and you are well advised to familiarize yourself with as many packages as there are, because it still remains the case that some will solve uh, uh, examples that others don't, and we've, we've been quite Catholic in, in, in trying to present as many different uh, developments as possible. Phaser um, works through this in a, a, a very neat logical way. Um, it it uh, finds a number of candidate rotations. It takes a subset of those through to trying translations. It, it will do that as it tries to build up complexes, adding in more and more. Um, and and th this, th the logic behind that is also very important to the, the success of the package, knowing what thresholds to apply. That's, again, something which you can um, influence as a user. How do you know if your solution is correct? Um, uh, Randy and Early tell me that they now can uh, look at the log likelihood gain and then they also need to know the number of reflections, is that right? And then tell me whether it's right. Early, Randy? Just the LLG. So there you go. They can tell you a, uh, a, a threshold um, which will indicate a correct solution. So that's very nice. Um, if you get less than that, there's a chance you're right anyway because uh, uh, your model yeah, depends on the quality of your model. So, so that's nice. Um, there's also other things that you, you should check. Phaser and the other packages will probably also have been filtering on the basis of packing, but um, they will be, have been principally looking for interdigitation of... Uh, sorry, they'll have been looking for interdigitation of molecules. A correct molecular replacement solution will not look like that. It will look like things contacting each other rather than um, trying to fill up the same volume of space and disobey Heisenberg. Um, but also, your, um, f there should not be vast empty voids. So a crystal can't have like a whole missing stuff. If you start to see those and you can't explain for it in any way, if you see interdigitation or a unit cell that's too full, consider twinning. There's a, there's a significant possibility that that will be the case. Um, your, your phases that you calculate from your model once it's been positioned should reveal not just, it shouldn't just tell you that the model is right, it should tell you where it's locally wrong. If it doesn't do that, then you should have some suspicion. It should be able to refine. Phil also wanted to point out that um, uh, getting away from the, the bias which is implicit in this stuff, um, automatic building tools like ArtWarp uh, and Buccaneer RAFMAC are, 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 are very good ways of doing that. Um, at low resolution, even if you solve the molecular replacement, you may struggle to get away from model bias, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the developments that are going uh, to happen to make that no longer the case. 
Uh, and if there's a single unique solution, it's more likely to be correct than if there mm -hmm. are many solutions. But as I say, if in doubt, do try to get experimental phases. Finish that. Thanks, Martin. So any questions? Now, remember, this is a study weekend. There are going to be some less experts. So if you think you have a fairly naive question, that's, that's totally fine. So, And remember to wait for the microphone if you can. Who would like to ask a question? It's also the introductory talk, so do not feel embarrassed if there are no questions. That, that is also fine. I guess if that was such a wonderful introduction, Martin, thank you very much. Chantal is next up. Dan Abigail is going to talk about molecular replacement trick or treat. I will first try to go to my first slide. So. I would have used a, a mouse. <laughs> Sorry. OK. So first, I want to thank uh, Pietro and Helen, because it's my first experience of the st study weekend. Sorry. Uh, where? Oh, it's a Okay, so as I said, it's my first experience of the study weekend and I really enjoy it a lot. So I am going to share with you some, some of uh, our experience with molecular replacement. And you, you will find out that I won't talk much about molecular, molecular replacement. I will mostly talk about what is right before molecular replacement. So I will present the things that were, of, uh, that were very useful to us to solve some difficult problems by molecular replacement. So as a biologist, and uh, from a biologist point of view, crystallography is made of two parts. One, which is a crystallization, which is considered as being art. Sorry, is it a pointer? Yeah, okay. First, because crystals are beautiful, and second, because even if uh, we have been investing a lot of effort in trying to rationalize the crystallization, most of the time, when you get a crystal, you feel like it's magic. And then the second step, which is uh, again uh, the, de the structure determination, then we feel like we are on solid ground. It's exact science since it's relying on physics. And so it should be straightforward to go from da a data set and to a beautiful map uh, where you will be able to build your model. And you know, all of you, that is not always the case. Most of the time, once you get an interpretable map, you feel like it's magic. So talking about molecular replacement, one of the things that may uh, make your uh, finding a solution very tricky are the cases where you have a low sequence identity in between the, the structure that you will use as a reference and the sequence uh, you want to solve the structure of. And it was uh, quite a long time ago that for the first time, uh, Shotia and Lesk did provide a, a relationship in between uh, RMSD and uh, a sequence identity. And it was uh, admitted very fast that we have here around 25% identity, a twilight zone, which corresponds to, the, to, to uh, the percentage of identity for which you will get uh, around two angstrom uh, deviation based on main chain superimposition, not taking into account the side chain. So. Since at that time we were uh, working with many projects for which we wanted to use molecular replacement, and we didn't have a reference structure that were with a, a higher percentage of identity. We are m m very much around the twilight zone. 
we thought that it could be useful to use homology modeling and use it in a straightforward manner. At around the same period, many people were already using homology modeling, but we did actually decide to build an interface which we named Casper, kind of a ghost interface, where we were gathering many uh, softwares we didn't build uh, in-house, trying to uh, improve the model quality in order to go into that twilight zone and try to retrieve some solution out of, uh, of uh, our data using molecular adjustment. So Tikofi is uh, expecting from the user uh, to select uh, a number of reference structures, accurate structures, and a number of sequences. And I will show you uh, that it is actually a very important stage. It's the way you will define the reference structures and the, and the reference sequences to be used because those data will be uh, put into a multiple alignment and uh, we choose actually the 3D coffee I will talk about later. And this multiple alignment will use the information coming from those structures and those sequences to try to get you the best uh, possible multiple alignment. And then through the interface, 3D coffee will give some parameters to modeler, which is the software we decided to use, to uh, provide a large number of models that can then be assayed for molecular replacement. Um, the interest also of uh, the multiple alignment is that you want, if you have access to the consistency of the multiple alignment, you will be able to see the region which are properly aligned, the core of the molecule or the core of the, st of the structure, and the one which are less reliably aligned. And you can decide not only to generate the, 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 the standard model, but also to remove some pieces of that model for those areas of the alignment which are not reliably aligned. So then we choose the MRA software, which is pretty fast and powerful uh, molecular replacement software. And as I said, I won't talk about the molecular replacement part. So, Along my point of view, the crucial step, as I said, is to properly define the sequence and the structure you will use to do your molecular replacement, to provide your multiple alignment. So the simplest way would be to perform a regular homology search. We can be used using BLAST. You will you identify in a databases sequences and structures which are homologous to the one you want to solve. And we actually have built at home uh, what we name GigaBlaster, which is actually relying on a cluster of PC, which means that it's very fast and you can in seconds get uh, the best sequences and the best, uh, I mean, the homology, uh, homology search results. Then, as it was said earlier, you can also rely on uh, uh, structure uh, families, on structured databases like MMDB, and there are many of them. And I like a lot the vast, uh, the vast uh, uh, server because here are gathered all the um, homologous structure of a given structure, and which you can analyze in terms of RMSD, uh, percent of identity, and uh, many other uh, parameters that ca you can then use later on uh, in, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to improve your molecular replacement models. So then, if you uh, don't have the chance to find very uh, close uh, structural homologs, then you can rely on the meta server. I present two of them, which is MESA and FUGS, that will provide you some clues uh, about uh, uh, some reference structures that you could use to try to get some models. I'm sorry, I will get a glass of water. So the multiple alignment software we decided to use is, is T-Coffee, which is available on our server. And it can, you can perform sequence multiple alignment but the advantage of this program is also that it allows you to combine structures and sequence information. So you will get a better alignment because you won't break secondary structures element and you actually can reliably align structures in between them themselves since it relies on the superposition of the structures. The other thing which is very good about uh, 3D Coffee is it provides you with a core index which is a measure of the consistency, not only of the sequences and the structures that you take 
to make your multiple alignment. I will show you that a little bit later. But also because it gives you uh, a level of uh, consistency um, parameter all along the multiple alignment, which means that you immediately see which are the, re the uh, region of the multiple alignment which are properly aligned from the one for which definitively they, they are not uh, they may not probably they may not be uh, assuming the same fold in that portion of the of the sequence <laughs> so which means that you can <coughs> decide to get the core structures from this multiple alignment to improve uh, your chances of success for molecular replacement so here the, is a casper interface uh, at least for the tcoffee part so you will first, I think I animated that, you will first get some information about the reference structures that you want to use to uh, align your uh, sequence of, inter of interest. So this is, for example, you get some uh, uh, level of identity in between the two reference structures, and in that particular case we are below 25%, but you will also get an average score, and I will show you later on, this corresponds to the global quality of the alignment. So you can access to, uh, to the multiple alignment it's, uh, itself, and uh, you will get this score I told you about, which is uh, for all those sequences around 70, and for the two reference structures only about 40. So in that particular case, that was fine, but there are some cases where it is very important to optimize your mul multiple alignment by inputting some more sequences that will allow you to, uh, to, uh, to create a continuum of sequence identity in between the reference structures you want to, to use to make your models and the sequence, of the, uh, the sequence of the structure you want to solve. So this is one thing that you sh could be improved by putting as many sequences as possible to try to correlate the, the structure you want to use as a reference with the sequence you want to solve. Uh, second, I told you about the, the, the fact that uh, you, you are provided with a consistency along the multiple alignment. Uh, so that's what is represented here. So it goes from uh, blue when it's uh, poorly aligned to red when it's a good uh, portion, a good alignment you can rely on. So which means that you will get a parameter from this multiple alignment you will be able to use for modeler to rely on the properly aligned uh, re region of the multiple alignment. So I also told you this, uh, the, the portion for which you are not uh, feeling comfortable with the multiple alignment, you can decide to truncate them. So which win means that you will provide two sets of models, the complete models based uniquely on the, on the multiple alignment, but also the one for which you did excise the poorly aligned region, which should be a more compact structure. And this is what you see here. Finally, for that particular case, you end up with a the, this is a full length sequence, and you will have some models that will be uh, built using the, the entire sequence, but you will also get some models for which you will have three segments which will be automatically removed from the models to screen for a molecular replacement solution. So, modeler was, uh, we choose modeler because it was very easy to, uh, to, uh, to map uh, our sequences onto the target and uh, to provide. Uh, and to use very easily, very efficiently, the information provided by the 3D coffee multiple alignment. For example, if uh, we, uh, let's admit that we are working with two reference structures and your sequence is aligning better with one, the terminal part of the structure and the second piece of your sequence is, better, is aligning better with the C-terminus part of your structure. Then you can provide models that will take that into account and you will have chimeri chim chim chimeric, chimeric structures. <coughs> I insist again on the fact that it's the, the, the most important thing the user has to, to, uh, to pay attention to is the sequences and the structure it is, he is providing because this is what will make the multiple alignment. And so this is what will provide the models. So then from this step, you get a number of models that you can screen for a molecular, use to screen for a molecular replacement solution. At the modeler stage, so in the uh, CASPER interface, you will get three kinds of representation. So this one is uh, the easiest one to look at. 
It's the sausage mode here. It's all atom, truncated and non-truncated uh, models, all superimposed. So in sausage mode, I forgot to say, but by default, it will provide around 30 models. Uh, so in sausage mode, this corresponds actually to the superimposition of all the models. So as you can see, the wire is thinner in the core of the structure, which, which means that most of the models are equivalent in the core, in the center of the structure. And the wider are the wire, the, the more variable are the models which are provided by modeler. The red pieces are indeed the most variable, but they are also the less, the less reliable pieces of the alignment. So which means that those uh, those pieces in red correspond to the truncated models. They are removed from the model uh, that will be used. So there is a consequence to uh, the truncation, which uh, I am going to try to illustrate through an example, which has nothing to do with molecular replacement at first, but actually you will see that it's a pretty interesting story, funny story, pure luck. Uh, the truncation, again, as I have been showing to you, when you have the full length protein and you truncate pieces of it, you can end up with a, a model that will only interpret 50% 50, 50 of your structure. So it means that it will not, uh, it may not be uh, allow you to go to the complete structure uh, solution. So uh, this is a particular case where we wanted actually to solve the structure of an orphan protein which means that it's a protein uh, sequence, uh, it was a bacterial sequence for which there was no homologs in a, in a databases and you, we didn't have any structure uh, to rely on and l I mean, no way to try to, uh, to solve the structure by molecular replacement. And actually, uh, when we get crystals, since at that time we were working many projects in parallel, we always checked that the crystal we are producing were corresponding to the protein we wanted to crystallize. So every time we got crystal, we were doing proteomic study just to verify what was in there. And uh, in that particular case, we had the huge surprise to find that our orphan was there, but it was also some lysozyme. This silly lys lysozyme everybody is using for to demonstrate uh, whatever in crystallography. This lysozyme was there in our crystals. But the fact is we decided to do use this lysozyme only to disrupt the cell because the protein was recombinant protein expressing bacteria. So it was there by chance and we could not understand uh, why it was there. But we thought at some point that, uh, I forgot to mention that the two proteins are about the same size, which means that our, our orphan protein is about the same size than a lysozyme molecule. And we knew that it should be two copies of each of the, those two molecules in the asymmetric unit of our crystals. So we thought, okay, maybe we will be able to solve the structure of our uh, orphan uh, protein using molecular replacement. So we tried and uh, used uh, the lysosome uh, uh, coordinates to uh, find a solution by molecular replacement and clearly identified two uh, molecules of lysosome in the crystal. We were very happy to see that we could not interpret the entire uh, data set using the, uh, the only the lysosome molecules. So then we uh, wanted to uh, we look, uh, here is the map we obtained, so uh, what you see actually here corresponds to uh, the lysozyme molecule, and the, here is uh, the, the residual density corresponding probably to the, to the orphan structure we wanted to solve. And it was, was not great quality, uh, I mean it was not easy to build whatever in there, we tried, and actually the best success we got was using the Buster software. We progressively digged out from the, from the map uh, pieces of uh, secondary structure elements that did allow us finally to interpret this, uh, this structure. And uh, so luckily, because of the lysozyme, we were able to solve this orphan structure, but it's a dimeric structure made of two monomers, as you can see here. And the funny thing is uh, it was serendipitously, we were also able to identify the function of this protein. This is the first protein inhibitor, a bacterial inhibitor of lysozyme, of vertebrate lysozyme. So, uh, I wanted also to say at some point that if we were able to solve that, struct that structure and progressively dig out the rest of the structure out of the map was probably due to the quality of the data set we had 
the data def we had re a resolution of about 1.6 angstrom. So that was very helpful also. also. And so very often when you are, uh, even when you have a molecular replacement solution, there are many cases where you cannot easily refine your solution and you feel like you will spend years just trying to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to refine this solution. And one thing that can help uh, in our experience is the resolution of your dat data. So yesterday it was mentioned that uh, dehydration can uh, improve the diffraction of, uh, of the crystal. It was also, also said yesterday that uh, many times you get a, a round of beam times and too many compared to the number of projects that you have to submit uh, to, uh, to bring to the lane. And so in those cases, and that's what we did, we decided that we should go dig out from our shelves all projects for which we were not able to, uh, to, uh, to solve the structures. And we noticed that uh, after a long period of time, when you look at your tray or at your crystallization plate, you have many drops which are just dried. And uh, we, uh, it was the case of one of, for one of that project. We had many dry droplets, but we also had crystals in some liquid droplets. So we decided to shoot the crystals since, as I said, we had beam, beam time and not as many projects as possible as, a, as the time we had to, uh, to uh, run our project. So we, we shoot that crystal and find out that if, while it was not diffracting before, years after, uh, after uh, the first trial, we got some diffraction. So we thought maybe since most of the droplets were dry, it was a desiccation uh, case. And actually that was reported by other people. I mean, like for the integrase case, uh, they, s they noticed actually that they had a, uh, an increase in resolution was due to a capillary uh, uh, break that was making uh, dehydration. So we tried just to build a simple system and to find out if we could try to uh, uh, have a procedure that could be uh, easily worked in the lab for uh, difficult projects. So in our hand, we were classically using 20 microliters droplet where you just transfer your crystal and uh, this droplet is made of the reservoir solution plus variety of cryoprotectants. That's also a way to screen for the best cryoprotectant. And typically, we, uh, we were uh, taking one crystal just to be sure uh, of what uh, we were seeing and beaming uh, in-house, which means that uh, it was no radiation damage, putting it back into solution, evaporating it for more, for more time, etc., etc. So like say uh, every five minutes and looking at the diffraction uh, a long time. And we noticed that for many projects, actually, we were able <laughs> to increase the resolution uh, during this process. And uh, so then what we apply now is we, uh, we look for the proper uh, protocol for a given project, meaning uh, what is the size, the, better, the best size of the droplet, how long we should evaporate it, what's the best cryoprotectant, and once the, we know what are the best conditions, we just take a fresh crystal, uh, apply the condition, freeze it, and then go to the beamline to uh, collect our data. <coughs> so here it's not that clear, even if it's uh, pretty clear. So I decided to, uh, to uh, show you an imp a particular case where you see that I mean, there is ice, but there are uh, also some uh, diffraction, but it doesn't look that clean. And a long time, you get a better diffraction to the point where you get very nice diffraction and increase in resolution. So there are many projects in our hand for which it was very useful. But the fact is when you do that, when you do uh, apply this procedure, uh, we did notice later on that you are kind of creating order out of disorder. And the fact is most of those structures have very high B-factors. So talking about, this is my transition between uh, order and flexibility. So it was said earlier that uh, domain flexibility can actually do ch change a lot uh, the structure you are looking at. And this is uh, something which is well known. There, there are biological entities. They can be made of uh, subdomains, so which means that they can be uh, moving depending on uh, the context where you are looking at them. So uh, one way to be would be to try to cut the, the structure into subdomain to try to identify their relative orientation through molecular replacement. 
but then you will need to have an accurate production of, the of those subdomains. And again, you will have to rely on proper multiple alignment and if possible, put as much information in that multiple alignment as possible, such as structural and sequence information. There are limitations, of course, if you have many uh, copies into the asymmetric unit, you may end up uh, having difficulty to interpret all of your, uh, uh, identify all the position of the each subdomains in the asymmetric unit. There are another case uh, I wanted to talk about because I, I don't know if it's a classical case, but uh, uh, we, are, we had um, a case where we had this crystal with two molecule per asymmetric units, and the two, each of the two molecules did adopt a different com conformation in the same crystal, just because it was a phosphate ion in the active site of one of the, of the molecule, the, we had a closed and an open state of the, of the structure. So in that particular case, if you take uh, a related structure in an open state, you will be able to easily interpret one of the two uh, positions. But then for the second one, you may have a solution, but the refinement may, may not be that easy to perform. So that's where uh, Karsten in our laboratory decided to, to get involved a lot into a normal mode analysis to try to see how it could help for molecular replacement. So normal mode, uh, you, you model protein as an uh, elastic network protein, and it was demonstrated that the lowest frequency mode are able to, to describe most of the change in conformation of proteins. And actually what they uh, did with uh, uh, Yvan-Henri Saint-Jean is to, uh, to take structures that were available in the PDB in the various conformation and uh, find out uh, how many, uh, how difficult it was to interpret, what, to go from one conforma conformation to the other and did actually find out that in most of the case, in 50%, sorry, of the case, one or two modes could explain the change, could describe the change in conformation. So we, we decided then to try to, uh, to use this information to provide better models. Uh, not only homology models, but this time com uh, conformational models. So there is two ways to, uh, to uh, use that information. So either you have in the PDB uh, a set of structures that correspond to those different conformations, and then you can, in, you can use those uh, reference structures to compute the modes that allow you to go from one conformation to another and generate all the, <coughs> all the intermediary model that you could then use for molecular replacement. The second case is when you have a reference structure in the PDB, but you, have, you don't have uh, many conformation, so then you can decide to screen for uh, uh, a change in conformation using normal modes that will help you interpret your data. And so a good way to do that is uh, apply several normal modes, retrieve all the models with the different conformation, the intermediary conformation, and screen for molecular uh, replacement solution just based on correlation and R factor. And that way try to improve your, uh, your solution. So the, the, uh, these are the two servers that I know of, but maybe others, which allow you to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to have the normal modes that will uh, allow you to uh, describe a change in conformation for a given project. And LDEMBO is uh, the one which is on our server. It's a very simple interface. Uh, you input one PDB file if you don't have conformational uh, uh, data in the PDB or you can uh, input two or mo many more uh, uh, PDB files if you have various confirmation in the PDB uh, database. And then submit your job, your job and you will get a set of results that will help you define which are the modes that actually uh, are the most interesting for you to prospect and it's very well described. In that particular case, it's a comparison of two conformation. So you have the overlap in between the, the, the first evoluting structure uh, on the second one that can help you to, deci to decide which are the best mode to apply to describe this change of conformation. You also, and it's, this is the most important, you will also get all the PDB files that correspond to each of those normal modes. And you can ask for as many uh, intermediate as possible and uh, a, a change in conformation of uh, various uh, uh, amplitude. So in some cases you will find out that uh, uh, one, mo two modes are actually describing well your change in conformation, and by combining them, you can try to optimize uh, the normal mode models to try to screen for again for molecular replacement solution. 
So those are the examples uh, that are actually on the side of a various conformation, uh, various PDB structure which are in the PDB for uh, those various conformation of a given project and the normal modes that can <coughs> help you uh, define what are the, the how to change those conformation. So this is a summary of what I've been talking about. I think I have been pretty fast, I don't know. Uh, this, I, I forgot to mention that I, I was invited around Halloween season, so that's what I, I, my title was Trick or Treat, but I'm mostly talking about trick and treat. So uh, the first thing to consider, as I said, is uh, the, the, the use of homology modeling. And uh, again, homology modeling has to be the best possible needs to rely on sequence and structure information that will help you uh, provide the best models. The second thing, uh, a consequence of, uh, also on th of, this, uh, of this multiple alignment is that sometimes you have to work with uh, truncated structures that, and it can be difficult then later on to refine your structure. So uh, I, was, I jo only talk about my experience of Buster, but I'm pretty sure that now things have, since then things have been changing a lot and many other programs are able to dig out a structure out of such a data, data set. Uh, I talked uh, also about desiccation and, the domain f and finally domain flexibility, which can be taken an into account again to try to improve the, the, your chances of success for molecular replacement. So here are the people who, are, who were involved in that work. So for the Casper software, this was done, the server was done by Jean-Baptiste Claude, who was a PhD student in the lab, and uh, with the help of Carton Sure and Cédric Notre-Dame for, the, for uh, interfacing the multiple alignment part with uh, the modeler part of the server. Georges Nabaza uh, was uh, very helpful for the uh, molecular replacement part in the, on the server. And Jean-Michel Clavery, who is head of the laboratory also. Uh, I talked also about El Nemo, which was the work done par, by Carsten Sure and Yvan Riz San Juan, and uh, which is very, very useful uh, uh, work whatever are the questions you are uh, asking to yourself, not only for molecular replacement, it's very interesting to, to, uh, to use normal modes to uh, look at a biological entity. And, and finally, the 3D coffee software, which was mainly uh, uh, done by Cédric no Notre Dame, uh, who is a specialist of multiple alignment, and uh, did input that uh, core index into the multiple alignment to help the user define the quality of the alignment. And uh, I'm all done. This is where we are, in the Parc National des Calanques, which is a very nice location uh, in Marseille. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Chantal. Tricks and tricks and tricks of how to get your models for molecular replacement. So, any questions? One down here. Um, <coughs> I was intrigued by your accidental crystallization with lysozyme. Of course, this was a lysozyme binding protein. Mm -hmm. But um, yesterday I was uh, uh, speaking to Pierre Rizzalla, and he told me uh, about protein alloys, as he calls them, which are co-crystals of uh, a protein of interest and another protein, <laughs> which you may want to use as <coughs> precipitant for the protein you want. Would you mm -hmm. envisage um, such a screen, say, with lysozyme, albumin, and a number of cheap, pure proteins sure. as a I was mostly thinking uh, as an answer about uh, antibodies, <laughs> which is a classical way to try to crystallize a protein, which is a uh, recalcitrant. Well, of course, yes, it can be, it can be a trial. So but the, se the second partner has to be ordered in the crystal. <laughs> so the, the, the use of normal modes has been what fraction of times does it rescue a, a case that doesn't work? Can you recognize those in advance from a normal mode analysis of your search model? In advance? Mm. I would say no. Um, if, you know, if you already know that your protein has some flexibility and uh, try to uh, run a molecular replacement even on a <coughs> using homology models very fast, you will find out that if it's not the proper confirmation, you are not able to dig, uh, to refine your structure. So in that particular case, then you can apply the normal mode. And as I said, it can be uh, 
kind of a pipeline in between normal mode uh, uh, results and the uh, uh, molecular replacement search where you will screen your result as a function of correlation and R factor. And at that stage, you will see if this is a, the change in, co in conformation can help you for the, your molecular replacement uh, problem. And, and can you give an estimate of how many cases this has made a critical contribution? Or what, what I can talk about me, but I cannot talk about uh, every project. In, in our case, it was pretty, uh, pretty successful. Uh, there are I mean, uh, either we would have done that or we will have to go through experimental phasing. So, um. so I guess a related question, if you've got ensembles of, of different structures where parts don't match, would you first cut things off or would you go with the ensemble and, and try and give everything? Oh, the ensemble is working fine, but my, uh, I mean, I don't have experience about, uh, I, f I did actually use ensemble to try to find a solution and this is working fine. But then when it comes, comes to the refinement process, I always had problem to, uh, to use this information. But as uh, it was presented also today, maybe using uh, this uh, starting uh, step to uh, run Buchanan or software like that, maybe enough to get a solution out of it. In my hand, it never worked using ensembles. So, um, One last question, please. But I mean, I, uh, maybe I should uh, precise something. For all those uh, normal modes uh, models, they are really models. They are not uh, used from the, this is not a, f a set of PDB sequence that are. Uh, sure. uh, at which stage do, the, do you consider that molecular replacement is a trick and that experimental phasing become a treat? For me, <laughs> when I have been spending too much time just trying to refine the solution, I know it's a solution and, uh, uh, and I cannot I would say this is a time I will have to spend to refine uh, the solution. Is that uh, what? That's not your question? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> For me, it's uh, when I feel like uh, it, 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 it's much better to try to, uh, to, uh, to stop refining a solution for which you are spending uh, days and days. Uh, Experimental phases are always a treat. Uh, Helen, you want to say a few words, I think? All of the speakers for the whole of the two days, if you can stay behind afterwards, please. And grab some lunch. Can I, can I make one quick announcement? Morning, just to tell you about the lunchtime bite sessions, which will be running both today and tomorrow. In the rooms out